Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, welcome to the Lake Maspinock Aquatic Weed Management Public Hearing. Um, my name is John Westling. I'm your Director of Public Works. I'm going to read the public hearing notice. The Lake Maspinock Weed Management and Control Advisory Group will hold a public hearing on Monday, November 18th, 2019 at 7 p.m. at the Hopkinton Library, 13 Main Street, Hopkinton, Mass., to consider the possibility of applying the herbicides Diquat and Endothol in Lake Maspinock in calendar year 2020 in order to control weeds. All interested parties are invited to attend and comment. Attendees are requested to park in the overflow parking lot at St. John the Evangelist Parish, 20 Church Street. For introduction, this is the Lake Maspinock Weed Management and Control Advisory Group. Starting from my left is Eric Sonnet, Drew Logan, the Secretary, Cynthia Estimer, the chair, Jamie Consalves, the vice chair, Jeffrey Barnes, and David Mitchell, who is our consultant. We do have a hard stop tonight at 8.30. The library will ask us to, to leave the room, so we're going to try to keep this concise, and we ask you to keep your comments brief. Speaking of comments, tonight's meeting is being televised and taped. So if you have a comment or a question, we ask you to come to the microphone State your name and address. And again, there is no amplification here, so please try to speak loudly and clearly. Cynthia? Thank you, John. Thank you all for coming on this dreary, rainy night. It's uh, comforting to see so many faces out here. And I think we'll have uh, an interesting presentation for you. To this point in time, the advisory group has held 27 open meetings to the public. We've had eight lake surveys when we've gone out and looked at things. And now this hearing is part of our continued effort to involve you, the public, in the weeds in Lake Maspinock. We are going to make a brief presentation about how and why we've come to the possible use of herbicide for our weed management in 2020. There will be no back and forth discussion during the presentation, and this is not a hearing with a vote. After the presentation, we will listen to your comments. We'll answer questions. I'd like those questions and comments come up to the microphone, please, and address them through the chair uh, so that whether it's Jeff with Conservation Commission or anyone in particular, everyone will have the chance to speak appropriately to best answer a question. So we are thrilled to have our certified lake limnologist, David Mitchell. He's been with us every step of this process. And Dave, if you have anything to add as we move through the slides, please. And with that, we will move ahead. As you can see, the impacts of excess vegetation have been the deterioration of the habitat. Fish, wildlife, and other species we have seen struggling. The fish, uh, the young fish are doing really well in all the hiding amongst the weeds, but the large fish uh, do not have the oxygen that they need. Um, we can see the deterioration of the wetlands. We are watching the diminished recreational activities of swimming, fishing, and boating. I will quickly add that when we did do our survey two years ago, we did ask how people use the lake the most. Boating is number one, which includes motorboats and canoes and kayaks. Swimming um, really came in second, and fishing. So those are three of the biggest uh, concerns that we watch. Um, as you can imagine, increased silting and the reduced lake basin capacity, and finally, a reduction of property value adjacent to deteriorated aquatic habitat. Moving on, I'd like to have you notice on the left, we have fanwort and variable milfoil. Make a quick comment that our past extended drawdown in the year 2015-16, um, we were targeting that, those particular invasive species. 
We were successful in knocking those down. However, to the right, the largely pondweed really came in gangbusters and increased over the last two summers to the degree that we anticipate more growth of that nature. And I'm sure there are a number of folks in the audience who have experienced some prop fouling such as that. Now, our recent status was the deep drawdown that we held in 2015-16. That was combined with a wonderful cold, dry winter, and it really helped control that vegetation regrowth for a couple of years. However, starting last summer, um, our monitoring, our survey showed that it was coming back, and in particular in the more shallow regions, uh, the North Basin, which is over by West Main Street in particular. <laughs> uh, this past summer of 2019, the nuisance weed of uh, pondweed had really uh, come to the surface, matted uh, made it difficult for the um, water ski slalom course, uh, really changed things pretty radically, and we have a concern for what that might look like moving forward. If you could look up here to the number two zone, that is the shallow North Basin end. It is along West Main Street, and you might see the number ones, which are the, uh, the edges, uh, the shorelines. If you look in our priority listed there, you can see that we, the advisory group, have identified that North Basin and the shoreline, and of course Sandy Beach, um, as the areas of highest priority when this advisory group needs to make a recommendation to John Westerling and the DPW. Other areas are less of a priority, you can see there. Um, this full report is also posted on the Lake Massmanoc website, as well as on the town site through this advisory group's page. Um, this is the extended, the last extended drawdown we were able to do. If you see the dewatered North Basin, it really um, exemplifies how deep that drawdown was able to get in order to expose that weed bed, and that is largely why that drawdown was so successful flying right along, um, you would want to know, I'm sure, this evening how it is that we further evaluated and refined what the management options will be moving forward, given this current predicament. We study the feasibility. Um, we look at the effectiveness, how long might, it, might an option help us, uh, the human health, ecological effects, cost, longevity of treatment, kind of redundant, excuse me, and the compatibility with the other options. An example might be in the event we were able to do a drawdown, um, what other option might we have that would couple well with that with no detriment uh, to the environment. So our final options, we are always thinking of the short and long-term management. We're always trying to look ahead. This is uh, perhaps a bit confusing to take in in one look. Um, my hope with this slide is that you can see under the activity <coughs> column, the drawdown has no cost related to it. And you can see um, the condition for an action um, follows. That's kind of our flow chart. You can see the benthic barriers, which would be used in an isolated area. For example, if weeds cropped up right around the boat ramp or most importantly by Sandy Beach area, a benthic barrier may be suitable in a um, situation like that. And then there is the small scale uh, harvesting or herbicide treatment or DASH, which is the diver-assisted suction harvesting. 
and you can see the cost there is in uh, that 10 to 30,000 uh, price tag there. In particular, uh, approximately $30,000 would be the high end of herbicide treatment for that entire North Basin area, as an example. The large-scale harvesting that we've certainly studied long and hard uh, is extremely expensive, and it's unfortunately not feasible for that area. Difficulty getting machinery in, the amount of rocks, how uh, would the machinery be able to move around, and perhaps most importantly, the disposal of the weeds they'd need to be hauled and would pretty likely fill the entire beach parking lot, because I know you don't want it in your driveways, uh, but then how would we, after it all drained and dried, then how? would we uh, dispose of that material. So we had many issues uh, preventing us from being able to move to mechanical harvesting as our first choice. So currently, uh, the position we are in is that we are not able to perform an extended drawdown this winter. We were not last winter able, and that is because we are not able to meet the requirements um, laid out by Conservation Commission in our order of conditions. Um, it, there is a well that would run dry, and we are not able to move forward with that at this time. So therefore, we need to be prepared for some management options moving forward. So we are only able to do the limited three to five feet this winter, and therefore we do expect that we need to be prepared and ready to go um, for next, next season. In that North Basin, I think I've touched upon the mechanical harvesting uh, and the challenges and the unfeasibility of it. We will be uh, talking, listening to your questions and comments later about herbicide, which is the purpose of our hearing this evening. Um, we will continue to review our management plan. And uh, just to bring you back, that this group did vote to pursue the herbicides as one of the more cost-effective effective, uh, methods for that particular area, for this particular point in time. Um, and that is what we're here to talk about, the two herbicides that were suggested that we are looking into are Diquat and Endothol, one or a combination of both that would be uh, determined if, in fact, it's determined that such treatment would be needed next early summer. Um, I am not going to read this all because it is my hope that, that Dave and others will be able to um, specifically address the DICWAT. Um, I do point you to the fact sheets that are available through the DNR. Um, there are many, uh, many fact sheets on information through the EPA. Um, and I, I really advise everybody, if you haven't read hundreds and hundreds of documents, to, to at, least, at least read a dozen to be informed. And endothol is the second herbicide under consideration. And it, um, it is a bit more selective than the diquat. But both of them will target that longleaf pondweed. They operate in slightly different ways. Um, and uh, I think I'll, I'll leave all the details to a little bit later on. All right, the gentleman at the table. So in preparation, uh, we must hold this public hearing. And thank you for making it as successful as it is already. Um, uh, the DPW then needs to identify vendors and obtain those bids, which are non-binding. If we don't need them, isn't that wonderful? So we would obtain those bids for herbicide treatment to ex expedite the contract process, the um, orders of conditions necessary. We need to be ready. Um, and of course, there are permits uh, to be gathered and that 
certainly takes time. So following town meeting in May of 2020, uh, the advisory group will go out again to do a lake survey. We'll assess the need, and if it is justified, we will begin at that time to prepare for herbicide treatment. So that's the time frame as it sits in front of us tonight. And again, you can see some of these, mass.gov is a great place to go. I have read the Massachusetts Lake and Pond Guide at least 10 times. Um, <laughs> the gear, <laughs> David, how is that, 300 pages? Uh, well, all right then, so there you have it. Um, and please know there is a lot of information out there read, uh, be informed, ask questions, which leads us to, thank you very much. Now we'll open it for questions and comments. Again, if you would please step forward to the mic so that everyone uh, can hear you at home. You all came just to hear us talk. <laughs> please, yeah, please come up to the mic, sir. Thank you. Good job. Uh, just for the benefit of people that are here. Excuse me. Would you just your name and address, please? Dave Gibbs, of an 81 Crockett Road. Uh, these are some pictures that were taken of the North Basin. Uh, probably were taken. Uh, beginning of August, which shows you the large leaf pondweed. So I'm just going to send pass these around so you can see what those people in North Basin really are up against. So that's all I, all I have to say. Thank you. Please. Well, thank you. I want to thank the Commission for obviously all your hard work. Andy Davis, Davis 203 West Main Street. I am in the North Basin. I'm one of the lucky ones. Um, the lake has really, I moved in eight years ago, and um, thank conservation for giving me the permits. Um, and I've seen the lake really go downhill. It's really sad to see. Um, my wife will not go in the water at this point. Um, I have a two-year-old grandson who I will not let swim in the lake because I think it's just too dangerous. I know we've had a couple drownings in the lake. I'm not sure if weeds had anything to do with it. But I do find that the lake is dangerous at this point. Um, it is sad to see what's happened to it. Um, I know the drawdown did help a couple years ago, uh, but somebody like myself living on the lake, uh, work all week, come back on a Saturday, and literally spend hours cleaning leaves, cleaning weeds that have come up on my property. Um, I'm lucky enough where the water seems to flow towards my house on the north end. Um, it's very sad because it really has made it very hard. Um, if I leave something in the water, it is covered with weeds. My boat is covered. My dock is covered with weeds. Um, even right now with the drawdown and I look at the remnants of the weeds, it's really extremely sad. So I really hope that everybody who lives on the lake or has to deal with the lake looks at this and says this is a safe option and this is something that has to be done to really keep everybody safe on this lake because I don't think it's safe right now and you know especially you know I know how shallow it is in the North Basin um, but those weeds are at the surface if I take my kayak out I am literally just going through the weeds it's so sad to see that so I really hope that you go forward with this thank you thank you Working. So it works for television, but it doesn't work for amplification in here. So you have to speak loud. Use your outside voice. Please let me know if you can't hear me. I tend to have a soft voice. Um, I'm going to present a different view on safety. And please, your, your name, name and address. And address? Oh, of course. Carol Essler, 16 Oakhurst. The North Basin is my front yard. I own two houses on the North Basin. And... Um, I do not believe that the weeds are a safety issue um, because I've never seen a weed take a swimmer down. I swim every day in the summer. And here we are again. 
Our lake has been described in this community as a gem, and it is. And I can't believe that we're considering putting poisons in it. It is almost beyond my ability to believe this. But here we are again. Diquat is a toxic poison. And, you know, this is the file from last time I fought this. And, you know, the poisoning of Diquat includes nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, kidney failure, liver damage, cataract formation. It's a potential cause of birth defects, GI problems, and kidney toxicity. Now, there is, it's still open to more testing from the EPA if it causes mutations. Read up. There it is. Now, people will say that, well, it's in such dilute quantities that we'll all be okay. Well, let's not forget that people said that about radiation, about aspartame, about DDT, and now about Roundup. They said all these things were safe, and we've learned that they're not. I really feel that nature is sacred, and to poison sacred nature for convenience and property values is just unconscionable. I really seriously cannot believe we're back here, but we are. I would like to teach my grandchildren to swim in this lake. I put my body in it every day, as does my husband. And I do not feel safe. And there's a lot of young mothers on the lake and people on the lake who also will never feel safe if these chemicals are put in. I've done a little bit of research into endothol. I have my old research on the diquat. But to know that diquat contains small amounts of a highly toxic, toxic chemical named ethylene dibromide, that it is recommended that 14 days that people refrain from swimming and from watering livestock, which means that your dog or cat cannot drink out of the lake after these things have been applied. And it remains in the sediment for up to four years. Motorboats churn up the sediment. Now, was it three years ago? Excuse me, I need to ask you to... I'll begin wrapping it down, So Cynthia. that everyone who wishes um, to speak has a chance. Motorboats churn Thank up you. the sediment down to about 15 feet. So that sediment where it still is, is churned up into our lake. What I want to say is I know that there's a well issue, and I feel so strongly about this that I have $1,000 towards drilling the well for those people who would lose water if we, that are we, keeping us from doing the drug. We won't be out. able to, yes, we won't be able to go into that subject, but thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Thank you. Hello, I'm Joel Stevens. I live on 15 Priscilla Road. I'm up on the, uh, the North Basin. My family's been on the lake for about 40 years. Uh, definitely seen a degradation in the lake, particularly the past five years. Uh, we used to be able to take the boat out, uh, just a small little uh, Minn Kota. Can't do that anymore. Um, also, the, uh, the fishing. Uh, the fishing in the North Basin is great because all the bass, they're within the weeds and the rocks. You never see kids anymore fishing, fishing on our side of the lake. There's one or two. Also, in the winter, with the extended drawdown, the weeds are up through the ice, and the kids can't skate anymore. Um, and actually, it makes the, the ice unsafe because the weeds are coming up, and it just, I mean, the ice is, the ice is definitely an issue now uh, uh, because of the extended drawdown in the weeds. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Paula Garland. I live at 50 Downey Street, and um, I'm a triathlete, uh, or a former triathlete, and I, back when I was doing um, Ironman triathlons, I was swimming in um, North Lake Tituit, and that's the time when they put these chemicals in the North Lake, and first when we were swimming, we were literally 
sort of grabbing the weeds and pulling ourselves along. And um, anyways, if, for those of you who don't know, the, the, an Ironman is a 2.4-mile swim, um, 112-mile bike, and then a, a marathon. But so, for the, so we were doing a lot of swimming. We were swimming every day. And my friends who swam, they were um, marathon swimmers. And I'm talking to these people who um, swam the English Channel. And, and they were world record swimmers. And they have, well, so let me let me get back to this. So they put the, the chemicals in. It was amazing. They put the chemicals in. The, the weeds went away. The weeds went away. It was fabulous. And so we swam right up to it. They put the chemicals in. We swam right after that. That was, what, um, 15 years ago? Um, nobody died. No animals were harmed. In fact, my dog swam with me then. She lived to be 16 years old. Um, and my friends, the marathon swimmers, they set world records before that. They've set many world records since then. Um, there were no problems whatsoever. Uh, and I'm talking to a group of, of maybe 25 people that swam five to seven days a week all summer long. So there were no issues with the animals. Thank you. Excuse me, sir. Just one moment, please. Um, I agree. Everyone deserves a round of applause. However, if we could tamp it down, uh, we might be able to chunk through more comments. Thanks Thank for you. doing it right so I don't get a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll give it to you right now. Chris Benning, 14 Downey Street, so I too am in, in the North Base, and I live there with my family. Uh, I think everyone is in agreement. The, the weeds are a problem. And thank you to the, the committee for all of your hard work. Uh, I am vehemently opposed to the use of chemicals. Uh, we have a proven method that works. I understand there's a lot more work that has to go into it. It's not ready for prime time yet, but we know that it works. One thing that I very clearly remember from this issue being vehemently voted down at the last town meeting that it came up at was that the diquat was not a one and done. It was at every single year, every other year, I forget which it was, they were having to use. It was someone who lived on Situate who got up and testified to that fact at town meeting. I can't see it. I'm sorry. I'm not from around here. I'll try to learn how to say it after the meeting. Um, my point being, this is, this is a stopgap measure at best. It's something that would have to be done time and time again uh, at a, an ongoing expense. I would encourage everyone to look for the drawdown solution. I would ask the committee for a clarification. Um, what I didn't see in the presentation, whether this needs to go back to town meeting to be voted on, or is this a whatever the committee advises, it's done? It does not need to go back to town meeting. Mr. Westerling, right? So the process would be that the DPW's budget gets to be reviewed at town meeting. And within the DPW operational budget, there is a line item for weed management of $60,000. Any item within anyone's budget is up for debate on town meeting floor. So if I understand you correctly, the only recourse uh, would be to defund that. That is an option. Mm -hmm. th there will be a recommendation made by the weed management committee to the director of public works and then town staff will evaluate that recommendation and the options and proceed from there. Well, Thank you. Please come up. Yep. Hello. Um, I'm Chris Ann Connell. I live at 16 Downey Street on the lake. Um, I'm actually neighbors with Chris, and we have a young family, um, a 10-month-old, actually 11-month-old, two-and-a-half-year-old. Um, I'm definitely not someone who's just across the board opposed to use of chemicals um, for treatment of basically I mean anything that's proven to work for if it's if it's not harmful to animals and people however I I just don't feel I'm not comfortable with all of the studies I've been able to read and I have done some research of you know read everything I could find in the most updated studies I just had a few points I wanted to throw out there um, and granted I'm not I'm not have a science background but I 
I'm a general consumer of scientific literature, and I these are some points that I, I'm uncomfortable with. Um, that, uh, as someone else said earlier, diquat um, to bromide adheres to the soil and sediment, and in shallow areas of the lake, it's easily kicked up. Um, in the North Basin, it's very shallow in front of my house. So right in front of our house is one of the areas where they're going to be, I, th- I think, spot treating, and also in front of my parents' house and my sister's house. Um, and I should mention, we're a fifth-generation family on the lake. We have a lot of history here, and our family's been swimming here forever. Um, and I just don't feel comfortable with something that can be reintroduced to the surface of the water that our kids obviously are drinking when they're swimming in it. There, I haven't been able to see any longitudinal studies that have shown that it is de facto not harmful to children or pregnant women. Um, so I don't. that is something I feel uncomfortable with. I also was reading, similarly to someone mentioned, that in the past... There's been a 14-day waiting period, though this has since changed in 2002, and tolerance updates include revocation of tolerable use in potable water, meaning it's unsafe drinking water to drink the water with any level of diquat in it. Granted, it's not a reservoir, but like I said, if there's kids swimming in the water, they're usually the most at risk, and they wouldn't ingest that water. So I would have, I still have lingering questions and doubts about that. Um, also, EDB, which someone mentioned before, I forget that full name, that's the acronym, is a component of diquat, and it's a known carcinogenic um, element um, through studies. So I, I'm just confused about how that wouldn't be something also of concern. Um, I have two more points. The, um, the limited studies, field studies to date regarding how other fish and aquatic organisms are affected also make me concerned. Maybe fish aren't dying from it, but do other Um, Organisms that live in the water and make the lake a healthy place or that fish feed on or birds feed on, it could affect the whole ecosystem. If we don't, we have such a diverse ecosystem in our lake. I mean, we have, we have so much, we have so much wildlife, so many birds, fish, everything. I would hate to make a short gap, as Chris said, um, recommendation to fix this solution that's really being held hostage by one member of the lake community. Let's be real. Like, can we really just call their bluff and do the drawdown and see if they're affected? I mean, that is an option. I know the town doesn't want to be held, um, you know, take on the liability, but I'm sorry. I don't feel comfortable treating our lake with something when it's just one person who we don't even know if they're truly affected because they won't let anyone on their property. So uh, the last thing is, I mean, Although it's not, it's said in the studies I read, it's not believed to be a cause of birth defects or cancer, but they don't say that it's definitively not. And there is risk of allergic reactions and skin irritation, and no one wants to have that either. I mean, I know we're at a point, and I know I'm probably making a lot of people upset by pointing these things out still, because we've gone over it so many times, but these are just things that I'm still uncomfortable with as a member of the lake community and yes we are moving but our uh, relatives are moving in and we'll still be on the lake a lot um we'll still be in town and members of lmpa so i just wanted to share what's kind of been on my mind and heart the last couple years as we've been researching this thanks thank you yeah feel free to to just approach the mic if it's available you don't need to be called upon i was just one second kathleen i was going to um defer to Dave Mitchell uh, the concerns that the resident has outlined. Uh, I read, I have read in um, all the chemical papers, and I wonder if you could address uh, liver, kidney failure, uh, skin irritation, and how, how do you how do you differentiate drinking, you know, a bottle of it or um, in the lake? How can you Okay. Help us put that in perspective. It's on. <clears throat> Don't touch it. <laughs> <laughs> just, just speak. Just speak. Dave. Speak to the audience. There may be other people that want to come up with other questions. I was kind of referring to see whether mm-hmm. they're additional, but I think these same questions would come up any time. Um, Cynthia is giving you kind of the very quillet notes of how the the, um, the committee came to decide which of the options they were going to go after. So this was thought long and hard. With regard to, I believe, um, Ms. Essler, is they, she brings up the fact that it's toxic. It is a toxic chemical. Like, mo- like most um, herbicides or pesticides, there is toxicity to it. The question becomes... Has this been tested? Has this been looked at? 
And in terms of that, in terms of the unknown, it is well tested. This has been registered with the Environmental Protection Agency since 1986. They do extensive toxicity studies. Um, I also have done ecological risk assessment, so I'm aware of that. That does look at all the different kinds of there's impacts. They, <clears throat> they basically do this on fish. They do this on birds. They do these on rats. They do these. And it is, it's true. I mean, if you get to a high enough dose, there will be an issue. The question becomes more of do they feel under the way it is uh, presented in the label and the application, the applications do it, is it a safe and effective dose? They've looked at this. The um, state of Massachusetts, for example, has also registered this for over 30 years. If you want a very um, <clears throat> dull reading but 16 pages of toxicity going through the various kinds of things and seeing what levels they are concerned, that's a good way of doing it. It's on the website. But at the way that it's used, it does quickly um, be taken up. Remember, this is an herbicide. It works mostly on plants, and it works like endothol because it works against the photosynthetic apparatus of plants and stops them from growing. It is taken up quickly by the silt. There was some question about whether it was taken up by the sediments. Um, in fact, that's one of the things that, that it does go into the sediments, but both the Massachusetts and EPA look about the ability of this to come back into solution. It's not considered bioavailable once it goes into the sediment. It gets locked up. Now, I've got a background to this. There's a lot of kind of like scientific material, and I realize, and having done this before in other communities as well, is that no amount of scientific data will make some people feel safe. It's just a fact that there's some people that will always – again, have concerns about any kind of chemical um, that's put in a, a, a drinking water supply or lake or whatever. It's very hard for me to judge, to kind of like reach them on the ways I would argue in terms of the scientific knowledge and the amount of effort that's made to make them safe. Um, I'm not a big proponent of herbicides over the other kinds of lake management. The person that talked about the stopgap is right. It's something that needs to be considered along with the whole lake management options that are available. But in terms of there being, um, <clears throat> this is not like an experimental uh, drug. This is not like something that is only done by people in the middle of the night. Um, it's been worked since the 1980s and to fall about the same time. And they've gone through a very big database. Um, what people picked up on the fact that there's toxicity. The, the one at the greatest risk is actually the applicator because he's dealing with the concentrated one. So he has to be the most careful about that. But once it's in the water, it goes away pretty quickly. They put reuse uh, restrictions on the, the water, um, as I mentioned, for the ones for a diquat, 14 days. for the. It's not unusual for other kinds of things to be done. If people get their lawns treated, they notice a little sign saying, don't you know, be on the lawn for a couple of days. So I'm not trying to say this is the answer to everyone's concerns and fears, but there is documentation. It's been registered with the federals. It's been registered with the state. It's widely used in New England. It's been used across the country. I do not know of any particular dem demonstration that, for example, that the sediments get ingested again and, and cause a health risk. Um, I guess that's about as best I can come up with it. I Thank have specific you. answers, yep. but, you know. Thank you. Uh, not <laughs> I, to I'm counter nerd, so I talk or about detract things. in any way from comments. Uh, everything is as valid. Thank you for your patience. Oh, well, well, Mr. One, one, one thing is, um, we need to understand is that while the extended drawdown, if we could do that, is not a 100 percent solution for, our, for the problems in the weeds. The we could be, uh, due to drought or some other um, weather condition, do not get a, uh, a sufficient killing of the weed bed to, to effectively prohibit the weed growth in the springtime. So we need to have, ideally we'd like to have both options. And we are working as a, on a separate track uh, with the extended drawdown, but we still need to have this is part of our tools in our toolbox. If I could just follow on what Jamie said, the reason that we uh, were, were limited by the operation and maintenance manual for the dam, and that was approved by the Conservation Commission, and that only allows us to have a one to two week period where if we were able to achieve the eight foot drawdown, it can only remain there for one to two weeks, and at no time 
can it go beyond January 15th? So as Jamie said, if the weather conditions, if it's either too warm or if there's a blanket of snow that doesn't allow the cold to get to the weeds, it may not be affected. So even the eight, eight foot drawdown is not 100% effective. Thank you for your patience again. Uh, my name is Kathy Sweeney. Um, I live at 193 West Main Street. I'm in the North Basin as well. Um, I have lived on the lake now for about 15 years, and the change in the lake is astounding. Um, and it's not just one or two weeds, but uh, we're, we're watching it change. And it's not just the people. It's not just our kids that are being affected, but it's the wildlife. It's everything around the lake. And so far we've had many years of ineffective treatment and every time that we're losing um, this time it's getting worse um, and I fear what that's going to look like if we don't take action it's responsible action that we're taking it's tremendous research it's um, very you know the, the best people around we've watched the lakes around us go it's not this is one and done it's not put it in and forget about it it's about maintenance, it's about controlling it, and it's about giving us back our lake, and hopefully the, so it's there for my kids that are there. I have three children on the lake. I love this lake. We spend so much time out there. It's changed our lives completely, how much joy we get. But if we don't take, take, take care of it, it will not be there for our future generations. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. I'm Dave Gibbs from Crockett Road again. Uh, I have a couple questions for uh, for David. Um, you're a limnologist, hired by the town of Hopkinton. Uh, by the EPA, correct. By the EPA. So, and, and I empathize with the people that came up with the concern with the nervousites. And please stop me when I get off base here. Effective weed management is a cooperation between extended drawdowns in judicious use of herbicides when needed. The extended drawdown is off the table. So now we're left with managing the population with the tools that we have available. As David started to say with the research, I don't rely on this for my research. I rely on people like David and the professionals that have done this for years. I have a database of seven other communities within the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, some that have been using judicious use of herbicides for up to 13 years. So people need to understand that when you have an extended drawdown, which is off the table this year, then you can minimize any use of any herbicides. As Cynthia pointed out, once approved for herbicides, committee then goes out and looks at those places that we're in danger of losing to the weeds. And if we now go back to the issue in Spindle Island and get our extended drawdown, we've never, I've only been on the lake for 25 years, so I'm a rookie, but we've never used herbicides because we've been able to manage it. I empathize with those concerns. I have grandchildren also. So in terms of what we're up against, we're up against a very difficult situation. He's here to advise us, not with this, but what he has in his bag of tricks and what his experience is. These people would not be in the position they're in right now. I know some people on this, on this committee don't believe in herbicides either. My wife's not excited about them. I've never been excited about them, but I'm confident in the research I've done, not with this, but with people like David and people that have used them for up to 15 years, people I know closely, that I know they're going to be safe, and it's not a long-term management issue. I repeat, effective weed management please don't, is extended please don't drawdown. Repeat, but please wrap up. Please wrap up. Please. Thank I'd just you. like to Thank respond you. very quickly. Um, we, we have just a quick response just, again, from Dave um, Mitchell. I, I think you're kind of giving me much more weight of opinion than <laughs> is perhaps due. Um, this is not just part of my bag of tricks, which I'm trying to think about exactly what is. But part of my job in dealing with this since 2015 was to work with the committee to put out what are the options there are and have them do the actual work and research. They had the big learning curve. I'm kind of available to say, here's the resources, here's the information. I'm happy to kind of 
uh, make that stand about what the what you know EPA does or the, the state does in terms of my own personal knowledge. But again, it's not me advocating. It was kind of the conclusion of a lot of work by the committee, some which did not believe in it before, and you know, still, again, there's reluctance. But you look what options are available, and this is one that has come up this year. Thank you. Uh, just before you speak, sir, may I see a, hand, a show of hands so I know how to chop up our time with uh, those folks who wish to speak? If you even think you might want to speak, could I just see some hands so I just have a sense? Okay. All right. Thank you. Please, sir. Uh, yes, I'm Don Kaiser of uh, 16 Oakhurst. Um, I'm probably one of the people who spends the most time immersed in that water. I swim every morning, half hour to an hour. Uh, the weeds have not curtailed my swimming at all. I'm in the upper basin. Um, and I've already won my, or had one battle with cancer in my life. You'll never know whether you have health effects from chemical exposure. Um, things bioaccumulate. We all have chemicals in our body. 243 chemicals in measurable quantities in our bodies that didn't exist before World War II? We don't know. Um, I think, this, and we don't know what will happen with this chemical. We do know that it goes, can enter your body through your skin. That, for the applicators, is their biggest risk. You get enough on your skin, it can kill you. We know that it goes in the sediments. It tends to bond with clay better than maybe what we've got. But motorboats will stir up that muck, put it, that stuff back in the water column every time you drive your motorboat down the lake. Um, I don't know. I just it's, it's a dangerous thing. I have a friend on the end of the Oakhurst Road who stopped swimming because we have used chemicals in this lake before. I've been here for 36 years. I think it was 37, 38 years ago. I don't know if it was 2,4-D or 2,4-5-T, which has dioxin. So we already have that in the sediment in the lake, probably. It's a chance. It's a risk. And you'll never know if you get a cancer or you get sick whether these chemicals are not. And I'm sometimes I'm foolish. I swam in the Mississippi River. Talk about somebody who's willing to expose themselves to horrible stuff. I will probably still swim, but I will not be happy. Um, I walk in the woods. I can bushwhack in the woods. I can bushwhack in the weeds when I swim. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, hey guys. Mark Edmond, 35 Woody Island. Um, I think there's a couple things just to consider from a larger picture on how invasive these weeds are. We're talking a lot about the North Basin. I'm on Sandy Island, uh, Woody Island just as you come across by Sandy Beach. And um, it was astounding this year that weeds came all the way around from the North Basin and wrapped around Woody Island as well. If the drawdown is not an option and it doesn't look like there's a high probability there and we don't take some sort of action in measured response, we're looking at a compound issue. And it's, it's exponential. And I just want that to be on the record because, again, the talk has been about North Basin but the entire lake is at risk just by the definition of an invasive weed. Thank you. Please. Sabine St. Pierre, 1 Woody Island Road. I'm a mom of a five and eight year old. My husband and I moved here about 14 years ago because of the lake. We love swimming, fishing, boating, skiing, and that's how we wanted our kids to grow up. About around 2015, when the weeds were really bad, you couldn't step foot off our dock without stepping into a sea of weeds. And my oldest was uh, very little. And there was no way I was letting him go in that. The topic of herbicides came up at that point. I panicked. Do, I don't want my kids swimming in that. I did my research. I learned. I became educated. Now that it's coming around again, I think to myself, I don't think twice about letting my kids swim in a pool with chlorine. Chlorine is a chemical. When it's not diluted, it's just as dangerous as the diquat and the endothal. 
if you look, they're about, uh, they dilute them to about the same part per million. But in a chlorinated pool, there's no further dilution. When you spot treat in a lake, as we're just doing in those particular areas, and again, it's not going to be every year, especially when we're able to get, I'm positive that we're going to be able to get this extended drawdown back. Um, it's further diluted in this larger body of water. So yes, it's not ideal. It's not what I'm jumping up and down saying hooray for. But I know that if we don't do anything this year, my kids will not be able to swim in our front yard again. And that's why we're here. Thank you. I'm Seamus, 36 Lakeshore Drive. Um, I, it's my understanding that Diquat is, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that Diquat is uh, banned in Scandinavia and Japan. Scandinavia and Japan. Banned? Banned, yeah. Um, for the reasons that people talked about today. One comment I would like at some point, hope that you guys would consider long-term solutions that would include dredging. Mm -hmm. right. We've had people volunteer in the past. No one's taken us up on the offer to help with that. So I'd like to approach yes. that subject at a later date. I guess my question now is, um, with what we know, and, and we really don't really know how much you're going to put in, do we? Do we do? Have we calculated the risk to the people that are swimming? Because you talked about today, Sandy Beach shoreline. Can I respond to that? If you wish, yes, I mean, please. Yeah. And <clears throat> other ones do risk, and they, they do scenarios in terms of when applicators get a chance, they are licensed by the state to do this, and they apply chemicals. They're concerned about lawsuits, too. So they always say is basically you follow what the uh, – the, uh, the instructions are, and those are the ones and why the dilution rate is prescribed, why the application rate is prescribed. So they're not necessarily just winging it when they go out there and put this stuff down. Um, in terms of the concentrations, again, it depends on whether you believe your EPA or USDA or whatever you're looking for in terms of a scientific background. They do risk analysis. They look at all the, the factors up and down the ecological food web, including humans, quite a bit and they feel that that is the safe concentration. So that's why they come up so with So can stuff. you tell us today what that concentration is, or can you give it to us later on so that we can go and look up what the risk is to our, well, to our it, children? Well, it's, it's actually in the, the documents that are, I think, in the EPA. Um, the, the EPA label will tell you exactly today. If you were to go up and look at that, it would tell you what the concentrations are. Um, if that's something that you would like to know, mm -hmm. I could have been arranged to have that done. Um, I guess the last question I have is, um, uh, if somebody was to become ill down the road, what is our exposure with regard to um, illegal? Well, the question becomes is, they become ill. How would you know? I mean, there's a great unknown, and I think that's been left. If you, The <laughs> same thing comes up in terms of, if someone has sickness, how will you know what was the causal factor? Um, you know, the, again, there's stuff coming through the air, there's stuff going out of exhaust pipes of cars. There's, the, there's a lot of environmental risks. Unfortunately, I'll use the example, there was a tragedy later this week, and someone put two cleaning agents together and basically came up with a toxic gas that killed the person. So, I mean, I don't know. I mean, how would you be able, I mean, I'm always looking, again, as a scientist, I go by ways of doing, you know, you do trials, you look, you change the experimental controls. I, I can't answer that. I don't know how I would know what that was. Um, whoever would try and say, this was um, what caused my cancer, would have a strong and very difficult case trying to say why that was the case and not a lot of other sources. So I guess I don't know how to answer that question exactly. But I can get the dose if you're interested. Yeah. Just mm -hmm. let me can know what the name through is. Can the chair and be happy? <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Hi, I'm Walter Garland at uh, 50 Downing Street. Uh, Sabine just mentioned uh, a chemical chlorine. So if chlorine 
bromine, algicide, cyanuretic acid, calcium hypochlorite. These are things that are used in swimming pools, spas, every day for ages. And it's necessary for the use of, of these environments to, to use chemicals. But you trust that the people that are going to be putting in the chemicals and the people that have tested these chemicals over the years and know how to dilute them are going to make it safe for the people to, to use swimming pools. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to have a swimming pool. You wouldn't be able to have a hot tub if you just put water in it. Uh, so there are things you need to do to make the environment that we use to recreate in safe uh, and, and usable and enjoyable. And the herbicides are just that kind of thing. This is what we need to make the environment enjoyable for the people that use it. And we have to trust, as we do everything in this country, uh, to the people that have researched it and tell us how to use it, instruct the people that are going to apply it how to use it, uh, and know that that's going to keep us as safe as, as we can with uh, anything in, in this world today. So I, I would just say, think about that. I mean, it's it's something we all take for granted when you use a swimming pool, but anything that's in there, if not used properly, will kill you. So it, it's no different from herbicides. So think about that. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Jackie. I'm, I don't actually live in Hopkinton, but I was invited here. I'm, I'm from the Milford Board of Health. Um, kind of downstream, I guess. Um, so first, I have to commend all of you for inviting your neighbors. Um, watersheds don't respect town borders. They just kind of cross through everything. Um, and I've been standing in the back, and I'm really inspired by all of you for, like, disagreeing with each other but being so respectful. Um, <laughs> it's really refreshing. Um, so I'm here just to talk a little bit um, give some perspective from Milford Water Company. Um, I've only been in my role for two months, but I studied environmental health for several years before this, uh, so I'm just going to take the word of my colleagues and trust the research all of you have done. Um, they said that it's outside of our raw water source zones, um, and it used to be part of our drinking water supply, but since it isn't anymore, they are not overly concerned um, as long as EPA recommended doses are used and applied properly, which there's been some discussion of here today. Um, so there's, they have no issue um, with their plans. And they also um, echoed the sentiment that some of you have shared here tonight, as well as some of the members of the board that, um, in general, there's they have reservations with um, a needless use of herbicides but this doesn't seem like the case um, when you're balancing the weight of the evidence. So uh, thank you for in inviting your neighbors, and thank you for all of your time. Thank, thank you, you very much. Very helpful. Mm -hmm. thank you. Don't be shy. This is it. It's over, <laughs> Final person. Uh, Ralph Edwards at 32 Lakeshore Drive. I've been on the lake for over, well, my family's been there for over 70 years, so uh, I'm still walking around. Um, I have a couple questions regarding, um, number one, uh, is, could someone describe the application of the pesticide or the herbicide in the lake and, and how that process works? The other thing is, you know, occasionally we have the beach closed down due to um, bacteria. Bacteria, yeah. okay. Uh, and I think the Board of Health is responsible for that. Yes. Would the Board of Health be involved with this application process in the North Basin? And how often would they test the water, you know, to make sure that it's safe? Is there a Excuse Board me, of Health? What he said is yep. correct. It's done by the Parks and Rec Department not the Board of Health. They okay. take water samples, they take it to an approved lab to have it tested. And most of the stuff that causes the beach to close is a, um, actually it's goose droppings. 
that wash into the lake. Uh -huh. <laughs> so it, it doesn't have a whole lot to do with the weeds or whatever. It's what washes in after a heavy rainfall. And okay. it's the stuff like your fertilizers in the yard and the goose droppings and those type things. But the Parks and Rec right. is a department in town that handles it. Well, the other thing we need to think about, too, is like years ago, is, you know, we have a, had a lot of septic systems around the lake, and fortunately the town made the right decision to put, you know, a, a municipal septic uh, service around the lake, which I think was fantastic. And I think that's probably helped reduce some of the effects on the lake as well. So, you know, I, I, I would just like to understand the application process so everybody could understand how it's, that's done. Thank you. Sure. Um, and again, I, I don't work for a weed uh, management company. But um, the, the process itself, again, would be through a combination of them looking at the EPA label and also going to the local conservation commission because it would actually be conditioned by the local conservation commission. Typically what they would do is set the limits of application. Usually that is done by buoys. These days GPS makes very precise. There would be a... So an application vessel, a small boat, and typically they have um, <clears throat> a little a tank, and then obviously you know either manifold or something putting it in the water, so that it would then be usually it's submerged application, and then they would have to go around and, and do a dose. They want to, like anyone, they want to make sure that they get the correct dose to control the weeds. They also have no. Uh, be careful that they make sure that they do take samples and look. And as part of again, Jeff can probably talk about whether this has been considered, but there are many example in Massachusetts of conservation commissions that have permitted these. There would be so it would not be heavy lifting by the you know the local ones. They could see what has been done before in terms of monitoring, whether it be monitoring down the scenes, would be monitoring also in terms of the weeds. So one of the things we have to make a check is you want to make sure that it's the weak. When you're when all is said and done, you want to make sure it's an effective treatment. And part of that is looking afterwards and seeing how well that's controlled as well. So there's not only just simply looking at the application of the chemicals themselves, but you want to see how well that particular chemical or combination of chemicals was in doing that, that weed treatment. So I don't know, Jeff, I don't know if there's anything else. That no, I, I would just add that. Um, the companies that actually perform the application of the herbicides have to be licensed through the state. Um, the companies that are out there that do it uh, have been around for a long time. There's only a few of them. Um, so it's not like, you know, it's your dentist during the week and then, you know, some guy's moonlighting on the weekends is going to take his boat out and, and apply the chemicals into the lake. So they're licensed, they're experienced. <laughs> Um, and they know what they're doing. So, uh, and as far as the application process or the permitting process through the Conservation Commission, as David suggested, it's something that has been done on many lakes. It's been uh, permitted through uh, conserv Conservation Commissions across the, st the state. Uh, so the uh, process for getting the permit is, I think, fairly straightforward, and then there's also state guidance towards conservation commissions about what they should include or not include in the conditions. So Correct. It's yep. a, all in all, it, it is a relatively routine way of treatment. I like so, but it's rather routine. Thank you. Hi, Lisa McDonald, 62 Pine Island Road. I just wanted to get some clarification from you about the larch pond leaf uh, weed. You had mentioned at the beginning of the presentation that when the extended drawdown was done, that that weed um, kind of it didn't help um, dampen that weed. It helped with the milfoil. So I'm just wondering if the large leaf pond weed is <coughs> resistant to the extended drawdown, and if that's the case, then, you know, I, like I eat organic. I'm like a chemical free type of person but so I'm not excited about the weeds either but I feel like if we don't do something then either we're not swimming in the water because there's chemicals or we're not swimming in the water because the large leaf pond weed is everywhere I'm in um, zone <laughs> 9 I'm at the very end of the lake I'm in the deep deep water of the lake um, and aug in August the weeds were all around my dock, so I can't imagine 
if something's not done, what my end of the lake is going to look like. Um, so if you could just clarify a little bit about that particular weed, if why it didn't die down from the thank you. extended drawdown. Thank I you. I have a very simple answer and may be corrected. Um, the uh, extended drawdown uh, of 2015-16 successfully targeted and managed to kill off the variable milfoil and some of the fan wart that was there, the invasives. However, in that was successful, and it created a void. Nature does not like a void. And the pond waif um, is indigenous. It's a native plant. It saw an opportunity. There it went. So it is uh, termed a nuisance weed because it is not an invasive. It is a native that, as we can see, is just really blossomed. Yeah. I was involved with the this whole issue when it came up a couple years ago, but I've not been as diligent of <laughs> keeping up on all this exciting research, so I appreciate you well, we clarifying that. <laughs> Thank you. I'll just add it again. Is the aquatic invasive, these are non-indigenous species, the kabamba, mm -hmm. the fan ward, and the variable milfoil, are particularly well treated by water level, um, the, the drawdown. Um, the Potomagedon's, a native one, is less so, but we found pretty good control, at least after the extended drawdown, is for at least two years. It seems to have come back uh, for a, a little stronger and quicker than the uh, the uh, nuisance, the I mean, the invasive species. We also have seen a growth of a lot of what's called wild celery or tape grass, which is the curly hue. Yeah, it comes to the surface. That also is probably it's a native. It's it it it's. <clears throat> also probably doing a little bit better than because of the drawdown. Because, again, they're, they're, nature does hate a void. It likes to find, you know, if something isn't growing there, something else will try to invade there as well. Um, <clears throat> so it's a matter of trying to um, balance out where your target organisms are and how to go after them. Thank you. We will close the question and comment period. I appreciate uh, taking many notes, as others have here, and we will consider everything very, very carefully. I'd like to look around the table and invite any other thoughts, statements. I have been on the lake fishing and boating for about 30 years. What we have today is such a catastrophe that I will not take my grandchildren in the boat because if they fell in these weed patches, they would not surface. You would not find them. They would die. If we don't take action and take it soon, what you're going to have, I'll tell you exactly what Lake Massmanoc will look like. Drive by Ice House Pond, because that is where Lake Maspinock is headed if we don't take action. It will be a weed clog bog, not a lake. I'm on this committee because I love the lake. And I understand, having watched this weed blossom over the last 30 years, how it has taken a great body of water and made it less so. The same thing has happened to Lake Whitehall. You never see a fishing boat on Whitehall anymore. When you drove by the parking lot five, six, seven years ago, there'd be 25 uh, trailers there. Now if there's one or two, it's a miracle because the state controls that body of water and they had the approval from virtually everyone to treat it with herbicides. And they were going to do it, but because of budgetary uh, considerations, they didn't spend the money. And now we have uh, a lake that isn't a lake anymore. The same thing is happening to Maspinog. The North Basin is clearly uh, the worst part. But as uh, the one lady said, I fish the deeper parts. There's weeds there. You can't believe how it is uh, 
attacking the entire lake. The weeds will win if we don't. So I just want to go on record as saying that all of my energy and virtually the energy of everyone on this board is dedicated to fixing the weed problem in that lake. And your support is tantamount to what we're trying to do. Thank you. That's a tough act to follow, Eric. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I don't want to be redundant, but uh, I think most of you know I've, I've lived on the lake for 15 years. I've been in town for 25, so I've used the lake for, for 25 years now. And have been really involved in this entire process going all the way back to gosh, when we started working on this eight years ago. And then, then this committee was formed. So uh, I, I guess what I just want to reiterate, and I, I think it's obvious to everybody, is this has been pretty well thought out. Um, we spent a lot of time looking at the options, uh, analyzing what other lakes in uh, Massachusetts around the country have done, and, uh, and don't take uh, our recommendation lightly. So uh, I'd just like uh, everybody to, to consider that. I'd like to thank everybody for your comments tonight. This is, a, um, as, a, as the lady from um, Milford mentioned, a really, really respectful uh, community, which I wouldn't expect anything less of the lake community. And the comments, uh, regardless of, of which side of this discussion you're on, we're really, really appreciated. And um, I think I speak for the whole committee by saying uh, thank you very much for coming out tonight. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, I think we need to take a step back and look at where we were when, when this committee was first formed. Um, the the amount of weeds that were in the lake was untenable, and it's still that way now because we didn't get the extended drawdown that we would have liked. Um, we've done tons of research. How many meetings have we had? 27 meetings? 27. 27 <laughs> meetings, and that's just one 40 we public events all in. And we've had, and we've had uh, you know, how much time that we've spent personally outside of, of the meetings reviewing and going over all these documents and doing the research and listening to our expert. I don't think there's anybody up on this stage that says, yeah, we're good, we're gonna go do herbicides, we're all excited. No, that was, this is the option that we've been given and that that's, we have to choose. There's, there's, at this point, we've looked at all the other options and you should look at, if you have a question about dredging or, or dash or something, look at our management plan and look at why we didn't select it because we did look at everything. If you want to dredge that lake, it's a multi-million dollar process. It's not something cheap. It's not a matter of going in there with a backup. The permitting process alone, it takes take years. Just, just think about that, think about where we are, think about the options that are feasible and effective. And that's what we've done. So before you, you, you think about your opinion, where you got it, do your research, and then hopefully you've come to that same conclusion. Thank you. So I, I'm also, I've been on the committee since the beginning. Uh, I've been in the Lake community for close to 25 years myself. Um, I've been on the Conservation Commission for close to 20 years. And I just echo the uh, comments um, from the other committee members. Uh, <clears throat> I just want to very briefly, is it evidence by what they said? I've been in doing lake management for 35 years, and this committee is one of the best educated, most dedicated group I've ever had the privilege to work with. Mr. Westerling, our fearless leader. Thank you very much. I sincerely want to thank everyone coming out tonight. This is not an easy topic. It's not an easy decision to be made. So your input has been very valuable in helping us towards a, a decision. I also want to thank the folks that are sitting to my left and to my right on the committee. Uh, they have done the, the 27 meetings is just a, a snapshot of all the hard work that they've done. 
And I want to thank Mr. Mitchell for his expertise. I thought I knew what weeds were, but he's proved me wrong. Um, and I also want to thank the folks of the Lake Mass Monarch Preservation Association. They have worked very hard uh, leading up to this position, this, this point in time, and have also uh, made an effort to help in, in other areas of lake management and managing the, the, the weeds. Uh, so we will consider everything very seriously and come forward with a recommendation. So thank you very much to you all. Thank you all. Have a good night.